So we talk about random variables and they are indicated by capital letters while if they are instantiated, so if, it's, if they assume a concrete value, they are indicated by lowercase letters. The set of possible values are indicated by calligraphic letters. So now the values, the concrete values indicated in lowercase letters of the random variables indicated in capital letters have certain probabilities. And these probabilities are written with P of A or P A of A. So P indicates a probability. The subscript A indicates that it is about variable A and A then is a value for which we want to have the probability. Since we use A already as an argument, very often I will write in shorthand notation P of A. Um, yeah, one could also write P of A equals lowercase a if we uh, want to know the probability for a particular value. This actually is not the probability for a particular value. It's a function that gives you the probability as a function of the value. And if you want to have the value of the function for a particular value of a, we could write it like this or like this. Uh, if we really give 5 as a concrete value, we could write it like this. Uh, if you write it like this, we don't know anymore about which probability we talk. We would need a, s a subscript A here. But usually I use these kinds of notations, these two. Um, the position of the variables do not matter, so it's they are indicated by name. So P of A, B equals P of A, B, A. So I, I'm... I allow swapping the variables because they are unique because of the name. Now it's quite obvious if we if we sample from a random variable that we get some value. So that means if we sum over all the probabilities of all the possible values we'll get 1. That's a normalization condition and any probability function or probability density function has to fulfill this normalization condition. Meaning that if you sample from a random variable, the probability, probability that you get any of the values is obviously 1. If a probability is given for two random variables, like down here, so P of AB, so this means uh, gives you the probability that event A happens, or A assumes a particular value, and B assumes a particular value. Now, if you don't care about the value of B and you are only interested in the value of A, you can sum over all the possible values of B because you don't care what value it is, and simply add up the probability of P of A and B. Um, over B, and that gives you P of A, independent of B. And that's called the marginal distribution. So you marginalize the probability distribution P of A, B to get the probability of A. P of A, B, that I've, which I've introduced earlier, is called a joint probability distribution. And P of A given B is a conditional probability. So that means, what is the probability of A given that you know B already? Now, the two are related because you can get the probability for A and B by first sampling from the variable b and with a certain probability you get the value of b and then you sample from a and you get a with a probability p of a given b because you have b already you, the probability of a might depend on b and might differ yeah depending on the b that you have The order in which you sample does not matter. So, 
could equally well write p of a b equals p of b given a times p of a. So in that case, you would first sample from a and then sample from b given the value of a that you have already. So both is possible. Now if you divide this equation here by p of b, you get this equation. So p of a given b equals p of a b divided by p of b. That is a way to calculate the conditional probability if the joint probability is given uh, and we know already that p of b can you, can be calculated um, we have this above right in this way yeah, just with a and b swapped Okay, so if you have p of a and b, it's easy to calculate p of a given b. So maybe I... Indicate here that this can be written as... Some over a of p of a comma b Okay, a little bit up, we had this equation. No? And if you now replace p of a comma b by p of a given b times p of b, which you can do because of this equation, then you get this equation here. And p of a in the above case, here it was called the marginal when you start from the joint distribution, and here it's called the total probability if you start with the product of the conditional probability and the probability of B. Okay, so we have learned about joint probabilities, conditional probabilities, and uh, the normalization condition, and the relationship between these, like in these equations. So here's an example. Assume you have two dice, one red and a blue one. The red one is just a normal normal die, while the blue one has only the numbers one to three, each twice. And you pick uh the first you pick a die at random and you pick the red die twice as often as the blue, and then you roll it. So if you do that very, very, very often, you get the um, following probabilities. So these are the values, 1 to 6. This is whether you pick the red die or the blue die. And P of C and N, C stands for color, N stands for number, is what's plotted here in this table. Um, if you add over all the num all the probabilities of getting a combination of number and color, if you add it up over the numbers, you see that you get a red die with probability six over nine. So this thing here that is P of C simply. Well, these ones here, here you add over the numbers and you don't care whether it's a red or a blue die. So these are values 
p of n. And this here is simply 1, which is a normalization condition, which means uh, if you add either this way or this way, or you add over all numbers in this field, you get 9 over 9. Yeah. Uh, here we see that that p of c, I'll move this here, that, that the color, so the probability of getting red is twice as large as the probability of getting blue, right? Consistent with what we said, how the numbers are generated. We see that for the red die, all the numbers are equally likely, and for the blue die, all the numbers 1 to 3 are equally likely, and the numbers 4 to 6 are impossible. Okay, so in this field, we see the joint probability P of C and N. In this field, we see P of color, so the probability of the color, because we add over all the numbers. Down here, we see the probability of numbers, because we add over all colors. And down here is the normalization condition, if we add over all these or all these. Okay. Now let's try to calculate the normalized, uh, sort of the conditional probabilities. So let's assume, so this means, so this table here shows the probability of color given a number. And we've seen above, up here, that the conditional probability can be calculated by dividing the joint probability by the total probability or the marginal probability of the variable that the conditional probability depends on. Okay, so we have the probabilities here and we have to divide in this case, if we calculate p of c given n, we have to divide by p of n. p of n, we have seen this here, are these numbers. So if we divide 1 over 9 by 2 over 9, the 9 cancels and we get 1 half. Now that is this value. So we do this for, for these six values. We divide these by p of n and always get 1 over 2, while here we divide 1 over 9 by 1 over 9 and we get basically 1, which I've written here as 2 over 2 in order to have the same uh, denominator in all these expressions. So what does this mean? p of c given n means the probability of a color given the number is known. Now, if the number is 4, the probability of red is 1 and the probability of blue is 0. And that's quite obvious because it's impossible to roll a 4 with a blue die. So if we get a 4, we know it has been done with a red die. Now, if we have a 2, then the probabilities of red and blue are equal. Now, why is that so? Well, if we have the blue die, so this is now an intuitive explanation, if we have a blue die, we have a larger probability of getting 1, 2, 3, but we pick the red die twice as often as the blue die, and these two effects compensate each other so that we have equal probability. If we add over C, that is down here, we always get 2 over 2. Right? So we add this thing over C given N. And 
we have to get one because of the normalization condition. Have I put it somewhere? Yeah, here you see it. Yeah. So this is so the prob the normalization of the probability if we sum over all possible values is here written in the simple form. But also if we have a conditional probability, uh, it has to add up to one because if we have selected B already, so if B is known, then and then we um, sample from A, then the probability of getting any value is still one, right? So that's the reason why we get the 2 over 2 here everywhere, because of the normalization condition. While if we sum over n, we get values 9 over 2 and 3 over 2. Now this is interesting. So these values are larger than 1. So, and that's important to, to remember that um, if we sum p of c given n over n, the normalization condition does not hold, and you might actually get values larger than 1. If you consider this as a function of n, it's called actually likelihood, and uh, it's important to know that likelihood is not normalized, not necessarily. Okay, if we, if we uh, do it the other way around, so if we calculate p of n given c, we have to divide these values by the values on the right side, and if we do so divide 1 over 9 by 6 over 9, we get a 1 over 6 throughout, right? So this is this one here. And if we divide 1 over 9 by 3 over 9, we get one, uh, two, yeah, 1 over 3 or 2 over 6, which is shown here. Now we have the normalization condition here on the right side, and we have the um, some of the likelihood down here, which is not normalized. Now this is quite trivial. So if we have the red die, then each number is equally likely. And if we have the blue die, as we said, the numbers 1, 2, 3 are equally likely, and 4, 5, and 6 are impossible. And therefore, since we have 6 numbers here and 3 numbers here, we have 1 over 6 as a probability here, and 1 over 3, i.e. 2 over 6 here. Okay, so we have seen above that the joint probability can be written as a product of a conditional times the marginal or total probability of B. So P of A given B times P of B equals P of A and B. And we have also seen that you can write it the other way around, so that this is also equal to P of B given A times P of A. If you now take these two equations here on the right side and you divide by P of A, you're left with P of B given A equals P of A given B times P of B divided by P of A. This is this rule. And that's the famous Bayes rule. It's actually very simple as you see. It can be derived in a very easy way, but it's quite fundamental to Bayesian theory. So in this equation, P of B is the a priori prob probability. So if you don't know anything else, that gives you the probability for B, while this gives you the probability of B if you know something else, namely you know the value of A. So this is the a priori probability, or simply the prior. This is the likelihood of B for a fixed A. We already saw above that if you have a value P of A given B, you can either interpret this as a conditional probability of A given B, or as a likelihood of B uh, for a particular value of A. So this is the... Okay, so this is the likelihood. I said this is the a priori probability of B, and this is a posterior probability or the posterior simply and 
prior and posterior means prior means before you know A and posterior means after you know A. Yeah, that's okay. And P of A is simply a normalization constant because if you sum over this, uh, if you sum this over B, then it has to be one, and that's what this A does for us. Okay, so we now have seen quite a few equations that involve two variables, A and B. And a very important concept is that of statistical independence. So, intuitively speaking, statistical independence means knowing the value of one variable doesn't tell you anything about the other variable, and the other way around. There are different ways you can write this. So, if you write P of A given B equals P of A, this is pretty much what I just said. So, if you know B, this is on the left side, if you know B, the probability of A does not change compared to if you don't know B. Uh, so, this is uh, the probability of A if you don't know anything about B, and this is the probability of A if you know something about B. Now, if these two are equal, that means P doesn't tell you any, B do doesn't tell you anything about A. So this is just using Bayes' theorem to, to convert this. This is uh, the same statement the other way around. And that's also important to know the statistical independence is a symmetric property. So if A is statistically independent of, e, of B, then B is also statistically independent of A. Now if you multiply this equation on both sides with P of A, we get this one here, and this we know is a joint probability of A and B. And this now is a different way of writing statistical independence, namely that the joint probability distribution of A and B equals the product of the marginals P of A times P of B. Yeah. So that, so how, so intu intuitively means that the probability of getting A and B together can be calculated by simply looking at the probability of A and simply looking at the probability of B and then just multiplying these two. Because they have nothing to do with each other, you don't have to take into account the uh, value of B when you sample from A or the other way around. So far we have considered only two random variables, A and B. But all these equations generalize to multiple random variables. For example, you can split the joint probability of A, B, C, D into a conditional of A, B given C, D times P of C, D. So here we have sort of substituted C, D for the second variable and A, B for the first variable. And otherwise, this equation is exactly the same as... Let's see whether we find it as this one here, yeah, right? So if we replace A by AB and B by CD, then we get this equation down here. Or we can write this, which would be um, Bayes' theorem in four variables rather than two variables. One can also take one of these equations above and simply condition everything on another variable. So this is shown here. So we have the base rule P of B given A equals P of A B times P of B divided by P of A. And now everything is in addition conditioned on C. So th these are ways to sort of generate more complicated versions of the equations above. So now as a final remark, I would like to stress that Bayesian theory or Bayesian formulas, formalism is not about causality, but it is about beliefs um, 
and the relationship between uh, variables in the sense of whether they give us information about the other variable. So, for instance, um, if you write down something like uh, P of A given B, that does not mean that B causes A. No? It could actually be that A causes B, but still B tells us something about A. So, in, as an example, consider uh, the street out up there, whether it's wet or not, and rain. Right. So, if if A is the probability that it has rained in the last hour, let's say, and B is the probability that the street is wet then obviously, if the street is wet, the probability that it has rained is different from when the street is dry. I mean, if the street is dry, then probably then it's very unlikely that it has rained the last hour, while if the street is wet, then it's quite likely that it has rained. I mean, there could be other reasons. I mean, you might have, might have just washed your car or something. But knowing whether the street is wet tells you something about whether it has rained or not, even though obviously the street being wet does not cause the rain. Yeah. So Bayesian formalism is about probabilities, beliefs and information and not about causality. Although causality uh, can be quite helpful, so considerations of causality can be quite helpful in uh, figuring out what reasonable conditional probabilities are.